This is Dror Moshe Kasuto. Thanks for watching. Pesach is um, such a, a meaningful holiday and uh, everyone can feel the, the tense, the preparation in the air. You cannot avoid it. It's uh, like it's like uh, in the eve of Yom Kippur, you cannot ignore the fact that it's Yom Kippur. You're just like just from every direction, it's 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 uh, it's surrounding you. So also Pesach is like that. It's like. The thing with um, Pesach is that that holiday represents the main part of the salvation. We know that all the Jewish holidays, we are celebrating them to remind ourselves of certain aspects in the salvation that we enjoyed of the Creator took us out of Egypt and <coughs> redeemed us from, from the hands of, of the Egyptians three or more thousand years ago. And we know that in all the holy days we are celebrating certain aspects, but like the protection of the Creator that protected us in the desert, so for that we're celebrating the Sukkot holiday and Shavuot because we received the Torah from Mount Sinai, so that's what we celebrate in Shavuot. But in Pesach we're celebrating the main redemption, the fact that the Creator spared our lives and chose us and took us out of Egypt and gave us our lives back and Something very meaningful and very deep is happening in that amazing night of Pesach. We're all talking about the redemption and we're reading the Haggadah and we're learning about the wonders that took place over there, the miracles that we all experienced, the amazing wonders that happened, the plagues that rejected our enemies from holding us and the Creator opened the sea for us and we all passed in dry land and there is one very important, the main part that is that man Moses that took us out of Egypt and he was the chosen leader to take us and his name is not mentioned even once in the Haggadah. All that night we're celebrating the redemption, the salvation that we enjoyed from, by that man, that without him we wouldn't have that merit to be redeemed. Am Israel, the nation of Israel, when we were there in Egypt, we, our mindset was so broken, so low, we were so sad and, and, and depressed, we didn't have no hope, we didn't, we were not able, we didn't have the merit to be redeemed. It's written that the Creator commanded Moses, told Moses to command us, to tell us that we must do two things and by the merit of those things and also took a loan from the future that we're about to take to receive the Torah in a few days from now, so while giving us some merits, you need to, to circumcise your children and you need to sacrifice a sacrifice, and by the merit of those two, two mitzvot, two obligations, and based on the fact that in a few days you're going to receive the Torah, I'm going to redeem you out of Egypt. So, we were not really ready for all that salvation. It's written also that if we would have stayed even one more second over there in Egypt, all of us, we would have been destroyed. 
the power of the contamination, the darkness that was there, over there in Egypt, the most impure <coughs> place in that generation, was so heavy on our shoulders and we, we didn't have the tools, the power, to deal with that impurity. We couldn't find our way out from the darkness. We would for sure drown there and disappear over there and no one would survive to, to tell the story of what happened to the Israeli nation. But there was one person that he was the redeemer of our, our, our nation, a person that grew up inside the palace of Pharaoh, that he was, he didn't have no obligation from his side, except of his pure heart that felt our sorrow, he didn't need to go and to be involved in all the sorrow of our nation over there. He was part of the kingship. He was a prince over there in ancient Egypt. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He was the adopted son of Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh. He was, he was a king. He was a prince of Egypt. Everything was perfect for him. Could have been. But he took it into his heart to pay attention to the sorrow to the pain, to the grief of his siblings. And he was going out of the palace to help his siblings, to help his people, to see what's going on with them. And when he saw that they're in sorrow, in pain, suffering, so he put it deep into his heart to think, to feel, to care. And he would bring out medicines from the palace, and he would bring out food from the palace, and he would bring all the things that he could do, and he would save them. And he was talking to the officers to, to take off the burden from their shoulders. And he took the responsibility on himself to help his people. He wanted that. And it came to such a peak, to such a radical situation, that he even got into a fight with one of the people over there and killed him to protect his siblings, to protect one of his brothers. Brothers, not from his close family, a person that he himself felt that he was his family, that in his heart it was his family. So you, today you walk in the street and you can say, hey, that's a brother, I want to help him. It's, it was like that. He felt that brotherhood, it was from his side. In the end of the day, we know that that person that he saved started fighting with him as well. Became his enemy after a while. So, you're talking about a real righteous and gentle pe person that cares about others, and he's going and just like, try to, 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 to make peace, like in, in a war zone, in the middle of, of a crazy situation. And he had to run away from Egypt into the desert and running away from a death penalty because he just killed some person in Egypt. And he had to run away. And for 60 years, he's standing alone without his family, without no one by his side and just praying and asking for salvation and begging for the Creator to open the gates of heaven and to redeem us all. And in the end, after 60 years that he's putting all his power, he ran away from Egypt when he was 20 years old. The redemption took place, the, 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 the first vision that he saw, the burning bush in a cave in Mount Sinai, when he still didn't know that it was Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was not revealed yet to, to no one. He was the first one. And in that cave he saw the burning bush when he was 80. It's 60 years later, and in those 60 years, the Midrashim, the ancient scripts are telling us that Moses was praying and screaming and begging and calling to a sealed sky that made out of iron. Like nothing, it seems to him for 60 years that no prayer been answered. He's calling and calling and screaming and talking and whining and begging and hoping and yearning and, and, and shouting and, and doing whatever and doing tshuva and taking more responsibility on himself and thinking of ways and talking and, and nothing. 60 years of tears and sweat and effort with no end. And after 60 years, the Creator chose that pure heart, Moses, to be the right one. And we're not talking about him in Lela Seder. 
and we're sitting and drinking four cups of wine and eating and, and happy and singing and everything. And where is Moses? Now, I want to talk about that. <laughs> I want to talk about that. Think about a certain situation that took place in our lives as the Israeli nation. We are standing, waiting for the salvation to come. Moses told us, listen guys, I'm going up to heaven, I'm going to bring down the Torah, the holy tablets are on their way, waiting. We had the, 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 the Amazon Prime, it was a two days delivery, three days delivery, it's about to arrive, Moses just picking up the stuff and that's it. He went up and people start dancing around the golden calf. And it was a sin. And there was Erev Rav, people from different nations that mixed with our nation. And there was a huge mess over there. And everyone are dancing and everyone are idolizing this, this, uh, this idol. And, and it was a horrible situation. And then Hashem, it's written in, in those scripts in the Midrashim, that Moses is over there talking to Hashem, and then Hashem is telling him, listen, now you need to go down, because your people are sinning, and you cannot stay here in heaven when they fell from their level. You are here with me in, this, in those high places, only because that you've been chosen to serve them, to help them, to be there for them. But if they're sinning, if they're not worthy for the salvation, so you cannot stay here anymore. So Moses is going down with the holy tablets, down to see what's going on, and he sees that everyone are sinning. He came back to heaven after all the horrible story with the holy tablets, and Moses is ready to sacrifice himself, and he's breaking the holy tablets. And we need to think about that as well. Why Moses is breaking the holy tablets? If he will deliver the holy tablets to a nation that are now sinning, it will hit them. It will damage them. Because they will for sure disgrace the tablets. They won't appreciate it. They were not in, we were not in the level to appreciate that gift. We were so impure and so contaminated worshipping that golden idol that we were not worth it, not able, didn't have the tools, the vessels to hold the tablets and to enjoy the wisdom of, of the Creator. So Moses could not give them to us, the tablets. And to bring them back to heaven, that's a disgrace. You cannot. You just received a huge gift, the most amazing and precious gift, handmade by the Creator, carved with the, carved with the finger of God. The first time the wisdom of the Creator been revealed to the world and delivered. And it's Amazon Prime. You like The Creator cannot be so humiliated and to receive it back. No, we don't want it. And also that we heard that Moses was arguing with Hashem to take it. And it's written, Gavar kochoshel Moshe, that Moshe overpowered the Creator and took, he kidnapped, he held the tablets and he's arguing and fighting with Hashem on the tablets. And finally he got stronger than heaven and took the tablets with him. Now to bring it back, it's a disgrace for heaven. It's a disgrace for Hashem. So Moses is stuck. He cannot deliver it to the people. He cannot deliver it back to Hashem. What can he do? He takes the whole responsibility on himself and he breaks the tablets. Now what can you do? You can kill him. And then he goes back to heaven. On that disgrace for sure, you, like, you cannot pass something like that. You're not supposed to accept it. You just broke the tablets. But who are you going to blame? You cannot blame them. They didn't commit that crime. They didn't break the tablets. You cannot blame Hashem for doing anything wrong. Hashem didn't do anything. Moses did it. He took the responsibility on himself. And then he climbs back to heaven. And over there Hashem is telling him, I'm about to kill them all. I'm about to destroy them. The humiliation, the judgments were so strict. Strict, the, the dinim, the judgment, the anger in heaven was so harsh, was so bad that there was a horrible decree that was about to take place on the heads of Israel. And Moses, what is he saying to Hashem? Kill me first. 
If you want to go and revenge them, if you want to kill them, start with me. Moses is standing between the judgments, between Hashem to the people, and he doesn't let those judgments hit us. And in the end of the days, after 40 days in the desert, 40 years in the desert, what's going on with Moses? Moses went back to heaven. He passed away. And we buried him? No. Hashem buried him. There was no funeral. No one knows where he buried. And we, after burying him, no, after Hashem buried him, we are moving on with our lives and entering to the Holy Land of Israel with Yahshua, his student. And where is Moses? No one knows. And we cried a little bit and we were mourning a little bit. That's not enough. And even worse, today when we're reading the Agadah, everyone are partying. Everyone are happy. Everyone are celebrating. Yeah, the redemption and drinking and eating matzot in the right amounts and eating all the sweets and wonderful things and reading and singing and the families are gathering. And where is Moses? Do you know what happened to Moses? Moses died. Moses died and Moses died disappointed in the worst way of them all that we cannot even understand and describe. When Moses decided to go and to redeem Am Israel, his beloved siblings, he took his wife and his kids with him and he took them back to Egypt. He is about to risk their lives, the lives of his beloved ones, and he's taking them with him back to Egypt. When he came back to Egypt, Aaron is coming out, his elder brother coming out from Egypt and sees Moses and he was happy and they're hugging and they love each other. And then Aaron, the elder brother, is holding Moses and asks him, what are you doing? You lost your mind. We're suffering here and we want to go out and you're bringing your family, you're bringing your wife and kids, you cannot bring them. And Aaron is forcing Moses to send his wife and his children back to Jethro's camp. Back to the place of her father, to her family again. And then it's a horrible separation. Think about the individual soul of Moses. This simple person that found the love of his life in the desert that dedicated his life to go and to redeem his people. And now when he is about to get into Egypt and to risk his life and he's doing it with all his heart, he must let his wife go back to the house of her parents and his beloved children, two babies, he's sending them. And all that time, few years that he is in Egypt, because even though that it takes us one hour, two hours to read all the story of Egypt and the wonders, really, in reality, all that amazing story took place at least in three, four, five years. I'm not sure, I don't remember. But few years that all the politics and all the conversations and all the plagues took place over there in Egypt. Another year and another year. And all those years, Moses cannot see his wife, cannot see his children, nothing. He's separated from them and he's sacrificing his life by the support of his wife Tzipporah that is sacrificing her life for her husband's purpose in life, for her husband's goal, for his siblings, for his family. And she never saw them, she doesn't know them. She born in the house of Jethro, she lives in tents in the desert. They're all happy over there dancing and singing into the night. And everything is perfect. And she now sacrificed her life for the cause, the noble cause that Moses for years is talking to her about the importance of saving those, his family, slaves that are being treated in a horrible way in Egypt. And she accepts it. And she goes back to the house of her father. And for years she's waiting over there and praying for the safety of her husband and the success of his mission. For years she's waiting. And then they all came out. And he's delivering us and he's bringing us all out. And he's the Redeemer. Hashem is opening the sea by the merit of Moses. He brings down the plagues on the Egyptians by the merit of Moses. 
all the wonders and all the, the miracles by the staff of heaven in the hand of Moses. He was the one, he was the messenger, he was the Messiah of that generation. He was the leader, he was a, a, almost the king of Am Yisrael. He took us out, it was 100% clear that the redemption took place by him. And then he is about to receive the Torah and Jethro and Tzipora with his children are coming back and they're joining Am Israel to that amazing part of receiving the Torah and Moses and his family are reuniting and everything is beautiful and everything is amazing and everything is great and super and everyone are happy and celebrating and receiving the Torah finally after Moses is fighting for 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai arguing and cancelling the horrible decrees and then again after the punishment that Am Yisrael, because of their whinings, because of our sins, because of our crimes, another decree took place. And Am Yisrael cannot cross the desert in three days. And from now on, it's going to take them 40 years to go in circles in the desert of Sinai. And over there for 40 years, Moses is going with Am Israel. He's their leader, he's their shepherd, our shepherd. But his family went back with Jethro to their camp in the desert. And when Am Israel, after 40 years, entering to the Holy Land of Israel without Moses, that passed away and died in the desert, all of Moses' family, his wife and his children, are still over there in the camp with Jethro. And they are not inheriting the land with us. They're not receiving not Jerusalem and not Tel Aviv and not Natanya and not Nahariya. They're not enjoying not from Hebron, not from Shechem, not from Tzfat, not from Roshpina, not Elat even in the south. They're not receiving a finger in the Holy Land of Israel. They're out. They're not considered part of Am Yisrael to inherit the Holy Land. And one moment in the life of Moses is so important for us to remember that when Hashem is telling Moses, I'm about to kill them all and Moses is fighting again and again because that situation took place few times that Moses is protecting us, our nation. And Hashem is telling him, listen, I want to kill them all and to destroy them. And Moses is standing and telling him, but what's going to be with the promise that you promised Abram and Isaac and Jacob? You cannot kill them. You promised their, our ancestors, their, our forefathers, that you will protect, their, that you will bless their children. And they are those children. You cannot kill them. You promised. You made an oath. So Hashem answered to him, I will kill them all and I will make a new beginning with you. You will be that blessed seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Your family going to be that family of Am Israel that will inherit the land. All the blessing was about to move to pass to the hands of Moses. And he rejected it with both hands. And he told Hashem, Kill me now and don't kill them. Moses refused to receive that blessing because he didn't want to see the sorrow of his siblings. He didn't want to enjoy anything for himself. And in the end, he did not enjoy it all. He died in the desert and his children and his poor wife are isolated outside of the camp of Israel, are not enjoying and inheriting the land. And where are they? No one knows. No one knows. And while we're celebrating Pesach, we're not even calling his name even once. We're not mentioning Moses' name. This is something that is unacceptable. Unacceptable at all. The thing that happens for us for thousands of years, the exile that we're suffering is in many, many aspects taking place in our lives, in our poor lives, because of that lack of 
gratitude to Moses. Because of our weak connection to that person that redeemed us. We're not understanding yet the importance of that man Moses. The Zohar Kadosh is telling us Moshe da Mashiach. The Mashiach will be Moshe. Moshe himself, he is the Mashiach, he is the Redeemer. He was the Redeemer and he is the Redeemer that will come and redeem us all. But we forgot about him and therefore that's why we are not able to recognize him even if he's standing in front of our eyes. Because we lost him more than 3,000 years ago in the desert. Him and his children. Him and his wife. Can you imagine to yourself the sorrow, the tears, the pain, the grief of his wife Tsipora, that dedicated her life completely for her noble husband, that she loved him so much. And she gave her spirit, her soul, her family for his cause. She sacrificed everything just for him, for her husband. And in the end of the days, she's looking at reality and her husband being left behind. He has been left behind and no one looks back. Those are the most important things that we need to do tshuva on. Those are the things that we need to think about. Those are the things that we need to take responsibility on. Those are the things that will bring the completion, the tikkun, that will help us to fix our lives, to have gratitude, to remember and to remind ourselves of that Redeemer. And even if the righteous people knew all those things and He didn't force us and didn't command us to call Moses' name and to mention his name and to praise him while we're reading the Agadah, it's only for that reason that we forgot about him and we need to remind ourselves of his greatness, of his importance. If someone is coming to us and telling us, Hey, Moses, 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 this is one thing. But if we reminding ourselves of that great man that fought for us, that he was that person but by, that by his merit we've been redeemed, it's another thing. It's a greater thing. That is something that can fix what that we caused by our bad manners, bad behaviors that, that, that brought us to all the sorrow and the pain that we're experiencing until today. A huge responsibility we need to take on all our actions, in all our thoughts, in all the ways that we are walking and trying to serve Hashem. We're keeping Torah mitzvot, Torah that had been given to us by Moses. Mitzvot that Moses was the one to explain them to us. Everything been given to us by him, by that man of God that went up to Mount Sinai and he's not eating and not drinking and not going to sleep for 40 days and 40 nights, three times. 120 days of his life he's fasting. He's not eating, he's not drinking, he's only talking and arguing and begging and crying and thinking and trying to find ways how to deliver the lie to us, to, our, to his people, to our poor souls. And he's sacrificing his life and the life of his family. The important life of individuals must be important to us. We must care about his wife Tsipora that had been left behind in the desert. We must care about that woman. Her life and her children must be important to us. The life of Moses' children, where are they? Like that I'm reminding and mentioning it so many times in, in my lectures when we're talking about Am Israel. And we're talking about Am Israel, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel. And basically while we're talking about it, usually we are basically trying to talk about the Jewish nation. But the Jewish nation is an illusion. A Jewish nation is not something that is, exists. The Jewish nation is a Jewish tribe that is one out of twelve of, 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 of a whole family of Israel. Jewish are one tribe. But what happens with all the rest of the tribes that are lost? 
we as Jewish are going to think all the time, oh yeah, I'm Jewish, yeah, I'm part of Am Israel, I'm so lucky. Hey, your siblings are out there and you're not even looking for them. You forgot about them completely. You're busy with your obligations, trying to fulfill them, trying to do the best you can. You have goals, you have hopes, you have desires, you have needs, you have your own struggles. Why we are so self-centered? This approach to life is the reason for the exile. When the Creator brought down fire on the Holy Temple, the pain that people started to feel was an individual pain. Every family has been hit by the judgments in that horrible day of destruction. And people lost children, and people lost their partners, and people lost their houses, and people lost their fortune, lost their land, lost their temple, lost their faith, lost many things. And they, they start, we start to be bothered. All right, where are my children? What's going on with my house? And what's going to be with my wife? And what's happened? And they took my car and everyone are running and crazy and lost their minds. Why all that happened? One hour earlier when the temple was built and we lived life of prosperity, everyone were happy. Because the sacrifice of the morning was atoning. That's how you say this crazy okay. word? For the sins of the night. And the sacrifice of the night was atoning for the sins of the day. And we lived our lives in the holy land of Israel, clean with no sins, because that we had the temple. And the work of the Kohanim, of the servants over there in the holy temple, was erasing and removing all the judgments, and all the, the, the sorrow, and all the pain from our lives. And we lived our lives freely, happy. As a whole huge family, everyone were friends and everyone were cooperating and everything was going in amazing harmony. The Levites were playing in the temple. Everything was perfect. Everyone had money, everyone had fields, everyone were healthy. Everything was perfect. Everyone had their houses. Everything was great. But then the decree took place. And judgments came down to the world and the temple been destroyed and people been scattered and separated to individuals to, 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 to start experiencing lives not as a nation, just as a spread nation, as a broken family, as separated individuals that are lost and looking for salvation for their own sorrow and grief. And that is the result of the exile and the redemption, the salvation that is about to come for us is that we're going to reunite above our individual troubles, that we will climb above our simple needs and our pain. And we're going to understand the bigger, larger picture that is taking place in reality and we're going to climb out of being so self-centered and focused in our own issues. Because even if you're going through your own hell, and no one is disrespecting your sorrow and your pain, you must understand that another person in the next street or in a different country, in a different land, is not experiencing less than you. And even though that your life are very important and precious and amazing and really like we want to help you in 100%, you need to have the same intention to help us because we're also going through our own hell. And not only us, the people that are here, the people that we're talking to, you have millions of people that doesn't understand your language and they're also suffering. And they're also experiencing pain. They're also losing their beloved ones. They're also struggling with financials. They're also dealing with, 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 with health issues. They're also afraid at nights. They also don't know what to do and how to cover their expenses. They also need to find another house and they don't know how to pay the rent for the last three months that they owe to someone. And they're all suffering. And when you rise above your tiny life, and again, I'm not disrespectful, 
because I'm going through my own life as well and I'm aware to how much a person can go through in life. But still, to uplift our mind to a higher point of view and to look at things from a different angle and to understand that what that we are going through is not only my pain and my sorrow, and my, it's the world's condition. It's the, the result of the exile after thousands of years of destruction. It's a thick and heavy darkness that is blocking our eyesight, our ability from understanding the whole picture. For that we need to reconnect ourselves to those things that brought us to reject our Redeemer. Because only by the merit of our Redeemer we have been redeemed and only when He will come back to us we will be able to be redeemed again. So we must understand what happened back then and to fix it for Him to come back to us. And it's not that He is angry or upset, just that we are not ready yet. We are not qualified yet. We still don't have the vessel to contain Him as our leader. When He will come back, let's say right now, we're not able to accept Him. He's so different than us. He's not like you. He's not like you. He's not like me. Everyone will think, oh, maybe it's, it's him. No, maybe it's not him. It must be my rabbi. It must be me. Thousands of students of mine think that it's them. Like, <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem. We're stuck in that loop. And we need to wake up. We need to wake up and to understand that we are experiencing a certain darkness that's been forced on our eyes and we cannot see. And we must scream to heaven to bring back that Mashiach, that Moses, back to us. And that we want to fix and to take responsibility on the fact that we forgot about him. So I suggest to accept on ourselves this Pesach, this Lela Seder, to talk about Moses on our tables. That's my suggestions. That's what I think that can make a big change in our lives. Really to bring him back to the picture. To understand what that holy family, not holy man, holy family. He was married. He had a wife. That poor woman sacrificed her life and died alone in the desert as well after being separated from her husband for 40 years, raising their children alone, left with them in a foreign land, out of the Holy Land, and today they're not considered Jewish. They're not part of us today. Where are they? And she knew all that. She experienced that sorrow, that pain. And we must have mercy, have understanding that she was, by her marriage, her husband was able to go. If she wouldn't support him and backing him up, he would never be that man that he was. She saved his life. For 10 years he was kept in prison, in a pit in the desert. And she was coming every day to feed him. And she would deliver him, bringing him bread and water on daily basis. And after 10 years, she made something and took him out of prison. And the prisoner took, and the, and the officer that, that held him there took him out from prison. For 10 years, she was feeding him when he was supposed to die. No one cared about him. No one went to look for him. Not his family and no one. She was the only one that took care of him and adopted him to her family and convinced her father to take care of him and got married with him, and brought children with him to the world, and raised them alone. And they all been left behind. We need to care. If we don't care, why did someone would care about us? If you want someone to care about you, first of all, you should care about others, and especially people that literally saved your life. And even if we're not looking at the ancient history all the Torah that you learned today, all the knowledge that you have today, been delivered to you by that family, by that poor man, by that amazing noble person that risked himself and threw himself into fire, into water, and worse than that, 
sacrificed everything that is important. Are you able to leave your family behind? Are you able to do something so... For us it's impossible. Who will think about something like that? And you're talking about a person that was so attached to his wife and to his children that he decided in the first place to take them with him to Egypt. He's trying to bring them with him. They are unseparatable. But when his elder brother came and started convincing him and telling him, listen, you're crazy. I believe in you. You're going to make it. We're going to succeed. We're in it to win it. Everything's going to be perfect. It's going to be great. Don't worry. Keep them out of the war. Don't bring them back to Auschwitz. Don't bring them back to, 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 to Egypt. It was the same. Millions of people been killed over there. You're talking about working camps. You're talking about officers with weapons that are raping and killing and slaughtering and abusing everyone around them. That no one has no properties. No one have no rights. That everyone are being slavered. Hell of life. So Moses hears those words of wisdom from his elder brother Aaron that he was in those days the leader of, of, the, of the, the Israeli nation in Egypt. And he says to his wife, look, it makes sense. Like, it's crazy. I didn't know that it's so rough, that it went so bad in the last 60 years. I didn't know. Like, don't worry, I'm going to come back to take you. I'm not going to the whole promised land without seeing you first. I'm going to come back. It, make it romantic. Like think about reality. Like they hugged each other for half an hour, for an hour before they separated. Didn't know if they're going to see each other again. Didn't know if they're going to see the face of their children. Like nothing was known. She's dying there, separating from her beloved one in the desert. And he's going on his mission like... You, I, I want to die now, like just thinking about it, like it's hell. But that hell took place. They took that hell on themselves for you. For you today, for me, for us to live. And where are they? We need to go and bring our siblings from the exile. We need to care about the children of Moses and to refuse to be redeemed without them. If in any chance in the world someone is coming to you and telling you, listen, I'm going to redeem you, you need to say, no, hell no, I'm not being redeemed now. No, I don't want that. No, but I'm going to save you, I'm going to give you everything you need. No, I'm not going nowhere. Where are all my brothers? Where are all my sisters? Where are they? Are they here? Are they with me? Yes, yes, I'm coming. If they're not here, I want to see all of them. I want to see millions. I want to see all of them. Not the Jewish nation. Jewish nation is one tribe, two tribes. You're talking about 12 tribes. Where are they? Are you able to forget one of your children? Are you able to forget one of your children? Oh, I have 12 children. Great, perfect. Now you have a salvation, but you need to take only five. Only four, only two, only, t you know, take 10 out of 12. It's a great number. 10 out of 12, you made it. No way! Are you going on that train with 10 out of 12? No! Two children of mine, are you crazy? I'm not going nowhere. Where are they? You move away. <laughs> I'm breaking arms here. What are you talking of? Fighting? I'm going to die and not going to leave them behind. You're talking about 10 holy, huge, complete tribes that we gave up on. Where are they? Oh, they're not keeping Shabbat. <laughs> you lost your mind. They're not eating kosher. Oh, they haven't kept their religion. Oh, are you crazy? Are you talking about your brothers? You can hear how cruel those words are that are coming out of your mouth. Giving up on your family, on your blood, on your spirit, on your soul. You're going to come back, think about it, Yehuda. What Yehuda? We're Jewish, right? All right, Jewish. Let's learn from our father. Yehuda could not accept the fact that Yosef disappeared. He said, how I'm going to come back to my father without our brother, without his child. 
That was exact, those were the exact words that came out of Yehuda, our father, right? We're claiming to be his children, Yehudim from the tribe of Yehuda. He said, <laughs> I'm going to climb back to my father when the kid is not with me. I'm going to come back, how I'm going to see the face of Jacob without his son, without my brother. We are talking about resurrection of the dead. We're talking about complete redemption. We're talking about salvation for our nation, for the complete wide world. All right, how can you face Jacob and his four wives, the holy mothers of our nation, as an individual? Yeah, I'm here. I came. Who are you? What are you talking about? Where are your brothers? Oh, I forgot. You understand how low we are? Even thinking about ourselves for a minute? And 24-7 we're self-centered. Oh, but my mortgage, but my expenses, and I didn't finish my cleanings, and Pesach, and foils, and, 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 and all the craziness. Like, what are we talking about? Those minor things are not even considered important compared to lives of our siblings. And this is why I am the co-founder of the Muna Project Inc., a nonprofit organization, and we're distributing this light out to the world, and we are not giving up on no one, and we are not forgetting no one until there will be no one left behind. And we're going and talking online and using the social media outlets that have been given to us by the Creator to make connection and to reunite all the families on earth that the Creator blessed Abram and told him, in, by, in your merit, all the families on earth will be blessed. By your merit, all families on earth will be blessed. All families. We don't know who and which. You cannot recognize. Are you from the tribe of Asher? I don't remember. Are you from the tribe of Dan? I don't know. I'm Christian or I'm Muslim. I'm Hindu. I'm whatever. Everyone is claiming something that he's been educated in the last 50, 500, 2000 years, last years. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't remember. His father doesn't remember. His grandfather doesn't. No one knows. No one knows. But the Creator, He knows. If there was one drop of rain that fell in the center of the ocean 5,000 years ago, and it didn't stop spreading since, the Creator now knows exactly its track, and He knows exactly how to pull it back. The Creator, He knows. He knows everything. The Creator, He sees the hearts. He sees the thoughts. He remembers the history. He knows all the things that we forgot. There is no um, forgetfulness in his, in his eyes, in his mind. He knows every, everything. He looks at you and he knows exactly which lifetime your spirit came down to this world in and from which branch you are to which family you're connected and that family and which marriages and, wh and what happened and which difficulties you experienced. And all those things are written in his scripts and everything is clear and open in front of his eyes and we forgot about it. So we need at least to scream to him to remind us or at least that the importance of this topic will be in front of our eyes and not to give up on none of our siblings and not to give up on the Creator's beautiful creation and not to let violent people and, and, and rude people to block the light of heaven that is treasured in this beautiful place that calls earth. And we need to believe in the holiness of the Creator that planted and treasured the true potential of complete whole redemption for the whole wide world, for all the animals, for all the, 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 the plants, for all the people, for all families, for all life, all life forms must be redeemed. To care about the rainforest, about the oceans, about the weather, the ozone, we need to care. We need to care. 
He gave it all for us, to us, for, to, to enjoy, to protect us. There is a source of healing and cure in the plants, in the vegetables, in the fruits, for all illnesses, for all sicknesses. There is advice and wisdom in the minds of the wisest people for all of our issues. There is enough money, enough gold, enough precious stones in the world to make everyone rich and wealthy. The only thing that we lack of is conversation, is communication, is peace between us all. This is the only thing that we lack. There is enough water, there is enough sun, there is enough food. You know how much food there is in the world and how many people are dying from hunger? It's crazy! How much wisdom there is in the world to plan and to build roads and to build houses for all the homeless. You know how many houses, millions of houses are standing empty when you have the exact same number of homeless people in the world. And just no one is talking to each other. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. We need to talk with ourselves about that. You need to talk with yourself about that. Where are you holding back? What are you hiding? Where are you blocking? Where am I blocking that bounty from spreading out to the world? And this is why it's so important to share those videos and to share your own thoughts and to believe in yourself and to send a link and to send a video and to send a post and to share a post and to like a post and to do those things because you don't know who it's going to reach and how it's going to save his life. And everything that you find inspiring, you need to share and to believe in the importance of it. Because an advice on, on good eating habits can save a life of a sick person. When someone else that can be your best friend won't be interested at all. He's on his way to buy a burger somewhere. And okay, so it's not for him, but it's for him. It's not for him, but it's for her. It's not for my closest circles, but it's for someone far away. And you can make those changes. Sometimes a person can share some, some meme, some flyer, some, some nice video that he saw, and suddenly it's going to catch 5,000 likes, 5,000 people saw it. Like, do you know what it means? Those are 5,000 individuals. And even if it's 10, even if it's 20. In the beginning, when I started giving my classes, I was talking in a class of something like 20 people. In the first YouTubes that we were making, we had maybe 20, 27 views on every video. That's how it started. After a few months, we had 40 views. I was so excited from having 40, 47 views. When we reached 70 views, I was, I was overwhelmed and for a good reason. Because we're talking about 70 families. We're talking about 40 people, 70 people. You're talking about individuals that will come to you and tell you, hey, thank you, you saved my life, you helped me so much, you don't know I was struggling with this, I was struggling with that. And we all heard those things. I'm not unique in that. I just got that thing and realized it and went all the way with my power to do it. But you have your mission and your power and the power to affect your circles and your surroundings. And you need to use your talents and not to judge yourself on how you look and how you sound and your accent and your nation and your... All those things are not important because there are people that will believe you only because that you are who you are and they're not gonna buy anything from me because of who I am. But to you they're gonna listen. Just because that you drank beer with them in the same bar. And it's crazy! Because of that you listen to me? Yes. Because over there in that night I needed you and you gave me the right advice. And like, he's still drunk. He's still stoned for 20 years. He didn't get over it. But still he counts on you. Because you helped him to climb the staircase. And without you he wouldn't make it that night. And you are his redeemer. You are his um, um, lifeline. You are his salvation. You are his link to the chain. You are the one that the Creator chose to help one of His children to come back. 
So for that, you must count on yourself and stop criticizing yourself and judging yourself and categorizing yourself. Let yourself go. Be free. Be yourself. Let the good qualities of your spirit shine. Shine in music. Shine your talents. Shine your thoughts, your positivity, your good vibe, your good energy. Flow with your rhythm, with your beat, with your amazing gifts that you've been blessed with. Believe in yourself and that's how we're going to conquer the world. Alone, no one can do it. Only Moses. But we forgot about him. So let's remind ourselves of how much he sacrificed and dedicated his life, him and his family. Again, I said once that Mashiach is going to be married and we're going to accept the face of Mashiach and his wife. Oh, you don't want to know the comments. Mashiach, how are you talking? It's written, David Malka Meshicha. You know Hebrew a little bit? Malka is a queen. Meshicha is a female. What do you want from me? I didn't say anything. It's written, David Malka Meshicha. It's a woman. No, no, I'm kidding. It's a couple. They're together. David and his wife. Moses and his wife. It's perfect. It's a match. What do you want from them? They're one soul. No. Only men. Oh, half of the world. Third of the, one third of the world is going to be redeemed. And what we're going to do with ourselves? Play chess, play football, drink beer. We need a complete salvation for the whole wide world. All right? Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this video very much. Please now remember to subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends to help spread faith in the world. For more, please visit amuna.com. May your light shine always and your requests should be answered with the greatest blessings. Amen.